Okay, we are starting a new series of our macroeconomics course. This is uh, ISLM module, and uh, and this is actually part one. That is the introductory lecture of this, this ISLM module. If you remember when we started our discussion of simple Keynesian, I mean Keynesian economics, we started uh, Keynesian economics with a simple version of that model. That was simple Keynesian model, and uh, I told you uh, during that time that we will start with a very basic model where there was only one market and that was a product market. Uh, so where goods and services are uh, produced and uh, and later on we will uh, we will introduce uh, more markets into our model. So and. We will go farther and farther. We will, uh, you know, generalize the Keynesian model farther. So this is actually the second series. Uh, the first one was on simple Keynesian economics, simple Keynesian model. The second series is about ISLM model. And uh, let's uh, let's proceed and let's see what exactly we are going to uh, we are going to do. Uh, <laughs> remember the. SKM in SKM, it was based on a uh, few uh, simplistic assumptions. As I told you, there was only one market, that is the commodity market, and investment was assumed to be autonomously given. So, so the simple, the simplistic assumption was that investment is not a function of any economic variable uh, within this within the model. Okay, so it was it was given from uh, outside so it was exogenous or autonomously given but here we are going to relax that assumption we are going to uh, you know introduce introduce a more general uh, investment function where we are going to assume investment as a function of rate of interest interest rate okay so so now and the the relationship is is basically assumed to be negative that means if r increases if r increases rate of interest increases then investment will fall that is the relationship we are assuming and therefore if you plot this in a graph where you measure investment horizontally and rate of interest vertically here so you get an downward sloping curve like this you get a downward sloping curve like this you can draw a linear function or a non-linear function that is not our concern at this moment so what is what it is showing is basically if the rate of interest is here say at r0 then investment is basically at say i0 okay and if rate of interest falls from r0 to say r1 here Okay, as rate of interest is reduced, investment will increase from I0 to I1. So that means the relationship is inverse, and therefore this I prime is basically I prime is basically del I del R. So change in I due to change in R. So that is basically negative. So I prime is basically negative, and I prime is basically the slope of this investment function. If you do that, no, I mean, before that, let me explain why we assume normally, why this assumption is meant that investment is a, is a, in, is an inverse function of rate of interest. I mean, there are many reasons. I mean, there are many ways we can explain it. And you are going to learn about investment function, uh, you know, in, in great detail in, I think, uh, in our macroeconomics two course which you are going to study in SEM, SEM 4 or uh, SEM 5, I think, I think in SEM 4, whatever. Let me explain why this is so, why investment is assumed to be inversely associated with rate of interest. Remember, one who is investing is basically investing to make profit, okay? So the profit motive is the, is the driving force behind making an investment. And think of a situation where you are the producer, you are the investor actually, and you are trying to 
do something you are to, trying to make something and therefore you are making an investment and the purpose of making that investment is basically you want to increase your profit and remember when you are producing something and for that you need capital and you need you need to make investment there is there is a difference between capital and investment actually change in capital stock is basically investment it's a flow concept so so that means if rate of interest increases remember whatever you are investing this rate of in interest is the cost of that investment okay cost of capital as we can see as you can see so if rate of interest in increases then your profitability your profitability should fall because your cost of investment is basically you basically increasing and therefore i mean in a very simple way you can say that if rate of interest increases then your investment will fall think of a situation where you invest on something you are you are producing something and you, you want to invest and you are borrowing money from the bank and for that you have to pay this rate of interest r on your borrowed money now if your rate of interest is say 8% and you borrow 100 rupees from the bank you will have to pay 8 rupees at the end of the year if if the rate of interest is 8% so your cost in that case is rupees 8 okay but if rate of interest increases to say 12% what will happen your interest burden will increase from 8 to 12 so that means your cost is increasing and if your cost increases your profit will fall your profit will fall now if the profitability of your investment falls what you will do this will discourage investment right because you are Uh, i mean you were you were making this investment just to <clears throat> just to make profit okay so if the profitability of your investment falls then you will make less investment then what is the relationship you are getting when your rate of interest was 8 was 8% and then it increased to 12% so when there is an increase in rate of interest r you are getting a fall in investment and therefore an increasing r is basically lowering your investment because that's lowering your profitability similarly you can explain this i mean if you if you you know uh uh if you just uh, let me erase these uh, those lines because it's it, it's messy uh, at this moment so let me erase them and then i will explain i mean this is also true for the if when i mean you can explain this when rate of interest actually increases or falls whatever if the relationship is vice versa you can understand it's always the case so so basically what is happening here instead of say rate of interest increase in rate of interest if there is a fall in rate of interest what will happen if there is a fall in r if there is a fall in r say say the rate of interest was <coughs> was a uh, was 10% and therefore your cost of credit of your cost of you took a loan from uh, the bank so you have to pay 10% you have to pay 10 10% of that borrowed borrowed amount so the cost was 10 rupees on a borrowing amount of 100 rupees now if it falls from 10% to say 8% your cost is basically reduced so what will do if r falls then that means your profitability is increased and therefore your investment sorry investment is uh, is uh, is not r here investment is denoted as denoted as i so what is happening here as r falls because your profitability is increasing you will you will do or you will make more investment and therefore the relationship is inverse okay Just concentrate on this one. The, the relationship is inverse, and therefore the investment function is actually downward sloping like this. Okay, and if you do that, if you assume that, if you accept that, that the relationship between investment and rate of interest is actually negative, and then just remember the equilibrium condition, the product market equilibrium condition, the condition we discussed 
in simple Keynesian economics, that will change a little bit. The change is here. Okay. So instead of instead of i which was equal to i bar, there i was assumed to be exogenously given, but now investment is a function of rate of interest and that's an inverse function. Okay. But that's going to change a lot. A simple change in this this uh, this uh, assumption will change the model entirely. Why? Just think the earlier model. The earlier model, just instead of IR, if you write I bar here, that was a simple model because in this equation, this equilibrium condition, where this is aggregate supply. And the right hand supply, right hand side is basically aggregate demand. So here you can see there is only one unknown, and that is y. Because once y is known, t is known, once y is known, consumption is known, investment is given from outside, government expenditure is given from outside. So this was uh, one equation. There was this was one equation and one unknown model. That was one equation and one unknown in y. So, so you can solve this. Actually, we solved this. We we solving this. We got the equilibrium income, which is y e. So if you are given an equation, this equation, and you are given only one unknown here, as uh, I mean. Y, so you can solve this equation and you can get the equilibrium income Y E. But now things have changed. How? Now what we are getting here is this aggregate demand is aggregate supply. That's there. There is no change in that. But now P function is also exactly the same. But instead of I equal to I bar. We have introduced a new investment function that is IR. I is a function of R. Then what is happening here? We have one unknown here, Y, and another unknown here at, as R. So this is actually you are having a situation where you have only one equation but two unknowns. One is Y, second one is R. So that means you cannot solve this. It's not possible to solve this equilibrium condition. And you cannot get one equilibrium output from this equilibrium condition. Okay? Because because as you can see, there are there are there are two unknowns in R and Y, but only one equation. How can you solve? one equation uh, with two unknowns. So you can't solve y and r. That's why we need another equation with the same two unknowns that we will introduce uh, in terms of another curve. I mean, uh, we have not introduced the highest curve itself till now. So that actually will be that will be done introducing another market. And that is money market. We will we'll talk about that later on. But for the time being, Let's concentrate on this issue of one equation and one unknown problem. I mean, one equation and two unknowns problem. So, so it's clear that we can't solve it. Okay, but what we can do is we can get pairs of y and r for which this equation will be satisfied. I'm giving you a a simple example of an equation with two unknowns. So before that, let me erase. Uh, these things because I need some space here to, to, to show you an example. Think of a situation where, where, where we are talking about uh, that an equation with two unknowns. Say y equal to twice x plus 4. Okay. So this is one equation. This is one equation. But there are two unknowns, x and y. Can you solve this? No, we can't solve this. But we can get different values of x and y for which this x, this, this, this can be, you can solve this. For example, say put 
I remember those class 9, class 10 days where we used to do this for drawing graphs and equation. So put x equal to 1. So if x equal to 1, then you can solve y. Given x equal to 1, you can solve y as y equal to 6. So this is one pair of x and y which is basically satisfying this equation. So instead of getting any specific value of y or x, you can get values of x and y which will solve this equation. Let's think about another one. If, if, if you put x equal to 2, so x equal to 2, what is the value of y? So given x equal to 2, your value of y will be 2 into 2, 4 plus 4, that is y equal to 8. So this is another pair of x and y, which is basically a solution to this equation. So instead of any specific x and y, we can get different pairs of x and y, which will solve, which will satisfy this particular equation. Similarly, if you, uh, similarly, okay, so this is done. So similarly, if you, you know, do this here, okay, it's, it's becoming clumsy. So let me clear this a little bit. Okay, so for the moment, don't want to make it clumsy. So now, 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 just concentrate here now. So, what we are getting here is uh, there is one unknown here at as R, and there is another unknown Y. So we can't get a specific value of Y or a specific value of R, but we can get different combinations of R and Y. Maybe one is R zero, Y zero. Another one, just like X and Y here. We just remember the the example we did here. So we can get different combinations of R and Y which will satisfy this particular equation or which will satisfy the product market equilibrium condition. So maybe one combination is R0, Y0 just like 1 and uh, 1 and I think the value was 6, uh, 1 and 4 and second maybe you can get another combination at R1, Y1 which will satisfy your equilibrium condition, this product market equilibrium condition. So we are not able to get any specific value of R and Y, but we can get combinations of R and Y, which will satisfy product market equilibrium condition. And when we plot those combinations and draw a locus of that, those combinations of R and Y, maybe this is, uh, okay, I, I, will, I, may, I will draw that in the next slide. I will, I will talk about that in, I mean, in more detail. But what we are trying to say is that instead of getting any specific value of R and Y, we can get different combinations of R and Y, which will give you the product market equilibrium condition. And when we plot those points in a graph, we get a curve, which can be termed as the product market equilibrium schedule. That is a curve along which the product market is in equilibrium. So we are not able to get any specific income, equilibrium income. Remember in case of simple Keynesian model, when we solved this equilibrium condition, because there was only one unknown because R was not there, so there was only one unknown. So we solved it and we uh, derived the equilibrium output as ye but here we can't get a specific ye instead of that we can we can get different values of our combinations of y and r which will satisfy the product market equilibrium condition therefore we can get a schedule of r and y which will satisfy the product market equilibrium condition that is termed as product market equilibrium schedule or will be named as is curve Okay, so this is the logic and then we will try to understand why I why I am drawing this as a negative one, I mean negative function. Okay, so you need to understand that why how I am getting R0, Y0 and R1, Y1 because 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 the functional because the functional forms here used in this equation uh, are, are general functional forms. So we, actually we can't solve this because 
I mean, only if you use any, you know, linear function or any specific form of function, then only you can solve the, just like the example of uh, y was equal to twice x plus, uh, you know, 2. So, if you use any linear function or any specific form of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, uh, form of functions for investment and, and consumption, then maybe you will be able to uh, find out the values. But we are not interested in finding out values. We are just interested to finding out the schedule, uh, how it looks and uh, what, what are its properties and, and things like that. And we will explain that in the next slide. So here we are basically uh, redrawing our graph, but there is a difference. What we are doing here is basically remember we are measuring y here in the horizontal axis. The horizontal axis we are measuring y, and in the vertical axis we are measuring aggregate demand. But instead of assuming i equal to i bar. We are assuming here we are taking investment as a function of rate of interest here and here. But why then I am drawing it in, as an as a horizontal line? Because because investment is a function of rate of interest, but rate of interest is not measured either in your horizontal axis or in the vertical axis. Okay, so because you are talking about y in the horizontal axis. So whatever be the value of y, your investment is given at this level, right? At this level. So to capture investment and rate of interest relationship, what we are doing here is we are using interest rate as a function of uh, investment as a function of rate of interest in terms of in terms of shifting the investment curve. Remember, if R1, if rate of interest falls, what was the relationship? If rate of interest falls, then investment will increase because the relationship is inverse. Remember that logic. So if that logic is true, then if this is the investment function, investment with respect to R0, okay? Then if this is the investment function with respect to R0, investment will increase. There will be an upward shift of the investment function if R falls from R0 to R1. Here it is R0 is basically R0 is basically higher because R0 is higher investment function is at that level at the lower level when R1 falls when our rate of interest falls to uh, falls to R1 investment increases from R0 to R1. This is a shifting parameter here. Remember our uh, remember the, the demand function you remember if you remember that say X demand in microeconomics demand was a function of price and there are so many other things price and there was money income also so how do you draw how do you draw a demand function because in this case because you have three variables right you have x you have p you have m money market but you can you can in a two two quadrant in a two quadrant diagram you can use two variables one is x maybe and then you can uh, draw i mean you can you can write p here so your demand function was downward sloping. That means if your price falls, your demand will increase. If your price increases, demand will fall. Now, if you draw that as a demand line, then if there is an increase in money supply, how do you capture that in terms of a graph? Because money supply is not here in any quadrant. Here you measure X, here you measure, measure P. So because you are talking about another variable, which is not in the graph, then you ask what is the relationship? What type of relationship is that? We know that if money income increases, then X is clearly, X basically increases. The demand for X basically increases for normal good, of course. I mean, we let, let me assume that this is not an inferior. So if M increases, then X increases. That means for a given P like this, for a given P, the demand was here. Okay. Now, if income increases, how do you increase demand? only possibility is you shift the demand curve rightward so that's why you captured you have captured that the change in money income in terms of a shifting of the demand curve or if money income falls the demand curve will shift parallelly leftward okay so this is how we when when there are several variables and we are we are drawing only a two quadrant diagram there are three third or fourth variable they are treated as 
we treat them as shifting variables just like here we, 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 are, we are using the same principle here also what we are doing here is because we have measured y horizontally and aggregate demand components aggregate demand means there are there you have consumption you have investment you have government expenditure everything is measured, measured vertically so you cannot draw a negative investment curve here because in the horizontal line you have y so just just try to just try to uh, find out what is the value of i with different values of y i is not supposed to change with different values of y because i is not a function of income i is a function of rate of interest so i is drawn horizontally when it is drawn against income but when we draw it when we uh, think of a situation where there is an increase in rate of interest or a fall in rate of interest i is going to change if there is a fall in rate of interest because the relationship is inverse investment curve this whole of it will shift upward and if there is a uh, you know uh, increase in rate of interest it should fall down now so now come back to our equilibrium so this is the aggregate demand line the only difference you, you, you just uh, you just uh, you just can uh, can can uh, can can concentrate here the only difference is this investment line just if you compare this with the simple keynesian uh, discussion then this is the only difference so what is happening here this is the initial one okay ad0 corresponding to this investment line so the equilibrium was at e0 now if you if you reduce rate of interest r1 here the investment curve is shifting upward because aggregate demand is a sum total of consumption plus investment plus government expenditure because investment is increasing this aggregate demand line will also shift upward because there is an increase in aggregate demand because there is a fall in rate of interest from r0 to r1 there will be an increase in aggregate demand so if you consider initially the equilibrium was equilibrium rate of interest was initial rate of interest was r0 and corresponding to that r0 the aggregate line the the the, the investment line was this one and corresponding to this investment line the aggregate demand line was this one and e0 was the equilibrium point so the corresponding equilibrium income was y0 so one pair of equilibrium you can say is r0 y0 this is one pair okay now if you consider another r which is lower than r0 that is r1 so this is your new investment line and corresponding to because there is a shift in this investment line there will be a shift in the aggregate demand line as well by the same amount by the, the amount investment has increased and so this is new aggregate demand line and so this is your new equilibrium point and the new equilibrium output is y1 so you get another equilibrium pair at r1 y1 okay this is how we get equilibrium in the, in the previous slide we were talking about those pairs which will satisfy our equilibrium condition this and and here graphically how we can i mean we can we can get different equilibrium you know pairs of r and y which will satisfy our equilibrium condition and one thing is pretty clear and that is most important important thing to note here is that when you started with r0 you started with a higher r right when you started with r0 income was y0 but when you raised your rate of interest from r0 to sorry when you reduced your rate of interest from r0 to r1 your income is basically increasing so if you plot r0 y0 and r1 r1 y1 that should look like a negative you know negative negative uh, downward sloping curve why because because remember we started with r0 start somewhere this is r0 right corresponding to r0 now in this diagram what we are doing is basically we are measuring y here in horizontal axis but we are measuring rate of interest in the vertical axis so we are basically plotting the results from this discussion this discussion of getting r0 y0 and r1 y1 so we started with r0 and the equilibrium resulting equilibrium income was y0 that means if we start with r at r0 and if you solve this equation 
then you will get a y which is equal to y0. You plot that, okay? And then you raise your r or lower your r. Here in this case, we have lowered it. So if you lower your r from r0 to r1, what is happening? Investment line is shifting and therefore aggregate line is shifting upward and therefore your income is increasing. So you are getting another y. So corresponding to a lower r at r1, at lower r at say r1, you are having another equilibrium income at y1. Okay. So basically this is one equilibrium point. This is one equilibrium point. This is one equilibrium point. And you can you can you can continue. I mean you can continue to do that. I mean you will get numerous. I mean thousands and millions of you know equilibrium points. If you if you consider one R, you will have another. For for each R, there will be there will be one Y. So if you if you plot all of them, so what is this showing? This curve is showing basically a schedule where on the curve. All the points are basically product market equilibrium, showing product market equilibrium. All the points are basically showing equilibrium in the product market and that is called product market equilibrium schedule. That is called product market equilibrium schedule or IS curve. It is basically investment saving curve because you know product market equilibrium in short can be presented as saving equal to investment. We have discussed this it many times. So that's why this is called, in, in short, this is called investment uh, investment saving curve or a product market equilibrium schedule, popularly known as IS curve. So we can actually, what we, what, what we are doing here using a Keynesian cross diagram, we can do that using, you know, the alternative, uh, you know, saving investment diagram as well. We have done that uh, in the next, uh, this is the next slide. This is what we are doing here. Again, here we are measuring income here and saving investment government expenditure tax here. This is my savings function as earlier. This is my investment line. Though investment is not exogenously given, but because we are, as I discussed, as I have already discussed in the previous slide, because we are plotting this against Y and this is not a function of Y, so this is horizontal. And similarly, the shift will be just like the previous slide. So, so initially the equilibrium was at E0 corresponding to R at R0. So the corresponding equilibrium value of income is at Y0. Now if you lower R, remember R1 is basically less than R0. That was our assumption. R1 is basically less than R0. If you raise R, you will have to do a downward shift of the, you will have to do a downward shifting of the, it like this. There will be a downward shift of the, of the, of the investment curve. But what is true for, uh, you know, Lowering interest will be true for raising interest as well. So what is happening here? If you lower your rate of interest from R0 to R1, investment function will shift upward and you will have a new equilibrium at E1 and Y1 as your equilibrium income. Same. It's exactly the same. Only, only thing is instead of using this equilibrium condition, we have taken C function to the left and so we have written this. Okay, so this is this is what we are doing here. So this is basically uh, this is basically uh, savings plus tax equal to investment plus government expenditure. If you do the same model without a government, you will cross this, cross this, and cross this. This will be savings as a function of income and investment. This that will be exactly equal to investment. S equal to Y. That's why this is this is this this is basically a relationship which shows that you know investment is equal to saving. That that's why the curve is called saving investment curve. Now, if you plot, I've already drawn that uh, in the next, uh, in the previous uh, slide. But if you plot this, uh, this, this, this results, these results in a, in a separate graph where you measure y horizontally and rate of interest vertically, you start with R0. Okay, corresponding to R0, this is your investment line, and so this is your equilibrium condition, and so this is your income, and you plot it here. This is your income. E0 is your equilibrium. Okay, and then you take another point because for drawing a curve you needed at least two points. So you take another point, you raise your sorry, will you, you lower your R, your investment line will shift upward, you get another equilibrium uh, point, and you are getting another equilibrium income which is higher than Y0. So we are just using that 
uh, you know, uh, result here, when we are lowering our rate of interest from R0 to R1, we are getting a corresponding income which is higher than Y. So E0 is one equilibrium point and E1 is another equilibrium point. When you join those two equilibrium points, you get IS curve. Okay, this is the equilibrium. This is the this is the product market equilibrium schedule. Actually, this is very important. Why? Because remember all the points on the curve. This point, this point, this point, all the points. All of them. There are there are millions of points, right? In the line. Infinite number of points. All of them we have product market equilibrium. But we don't know where the economy is. What is the equilibrium of the economy? Till now, we are just able to understand how the product market equilibrium condition. So this is a part of that story. This is the this is a part of the total economy, and that that is why I was I was telling you in the beginning that this is basically a model where we have we have different other markets as well. We have started with a product market, then we will introduce another another market, a money market, and then from from there we'll get another curve that is the LM curve and and plotting IS and LM together, we'll get the equilibrium of the economy. In the next slide, what we will do is uh, we'll try to derive IS curve from a different angle. It's basically, it's called uh, is a loanable fund interpretation of IS curve. Okay, so what is that? I mean, this is also not uh, that difficult. I mean, just 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 think about the equilibrium condition. Okay. Income equal to consumption, which is a function of disposable income, plus investment, which is an inverse function of rate of interest, and then government expenditure, which is which is you know uh, exogenously given. And then you you just take C to the left and G bar to the left as well. So what is this giving? Is income minus consumption minus government expenditure. This is basically income minus expenditure by public as well as government. I mean private as well as government. So this is basically the supply of loanable funds. This is basically what we call national savings. Because why this is called national savings? This is basically your total income minus your total expenditure by by households and as well as government. Okay. So this is your income and then you take out expenditure from that. So this is your national savings. And here the remaining amount is basically IR, which is demand for loanable fund. That means what we are trying to, I mean, the, the same, you know, it, it's basically saving equal to investment. Okay. So, so we are presenting the equilibrium condition in terms of total national savings is equal to total investment. Where savings is a function of, as you can understand here, consumption, because consumption is a function of rate of interest and there was supply uh, in, in the left hand side. So saving will be a function of income. And investment is a function of rate of interest, which is inversely, uh, which is inversely related. So we draw this. So this is basically a loanable fund, supply of loanable funds, and investors are basically demanders of loanable funds. So those who are trying to invest, they are demanding loan, and 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 this is the supply of those. And equilibrium will be there when investment is exactly equal to savings and then how it is going to uh, how how the economy is going to uh, be in equilibrium to the adjustment of r okay because if there is a mismatch of you know demand and supply r will change of course y will also change and that will bring back equilibrium in the economy and to 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 present that let me draw the investment function here so instead of so instead of uh, using our earlier uh, diagrams, what we what we are doing here is we are measuring R vertically and investment and saving horizontally. Okay, so here as you can understand, because we are measuring measuring investment and rate of interest in two axes. So what is happening here? We we can draw the investment line which is downward sloping. Okay, which is downward sloping like like this. But because saving is a function of income, same logic. Because we are not measuring income anywhere, so saving is 
exogenously looks like exogenously given for a given value of y this is saving okay remember saving is not related to rate of interest that why that's why whatever be the value of rate of interest whatever be the value of rate of interest saving is this much only this much s0 say this is s0 saving can increase only y0 if y0 increase say if y0 increases to y1 where y1 is greater than y0 because we know that there is a positive relationship between saving and income because s prime is greater than 0 we know that from our discussion on saving function so what will happen if there is an increase in saving the saving curve is basically the saving curve is going to shift right way. okay so we are doing we are using the same logic but instead of using r as a shifting parameter as we have done that in our previous graphs here we are plotting the graph against r and we are using y as the shifting parameter so this is my initial equilibrium condition okay b0 so what we are getting is r0 we start with r0 and e0 is the equilibrium condition so so when we start with an income y0 the corresponding equilibrium output sorry the corresponding equilibrium rate of interest is coming out to be r0 now if you raise your income from y0 to y1 what will happen saving function will shift rightward like this because saving is a function of income and 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 so you have a new saving line at sy1 and you have a new equilibrium point at e1 with rate of interest as r1 so what we are getting if you start with y0 here so what we are doing here is we are starting with y0 in in our previous slides we started with one r0 and then we you know we derived the corresponding uh, equilibrium income here we are doing the the opposite thing here what is happening we are starting with y0 and so corresponding to y0 the equilibrium rate of interest is r0 so this is one point and then if you raise your income to y1 then corresponding to that raised income of y1 you are getting one another equilibrium point where your rate of interest is r1 which is lower than r0 and if you join those two points you will get a is curve like this and remember how the adjustment is basically happening here the adjustment is happening here like this when your when your income is increased when your income is increased what is happening when your income is increased that means your supply of loanable fund that is s is increasing but your demand for loanable fund is as it was earlier so now you have a situation where your supply is basically greater than demand because you have raised your income you have a greater supply of loanable fund in the economy but your demand is lower and therefore you have an excess supply in the loanable fund market and as you know when there is excess supply price should fall so if there is excess supply in the market of loanable fund r will fall so what is happening here corresponding to a higher value of y you are getting a lower value of r so corresponding to here corresponding to a higher value of y you are getting a lower value of r and when you plot this result in terms of a graph this is called is curve okay this is how we derive is curve from uh from uh you know mm, uh, product market equilibrium condition remember you don't have to do all the graphs where you will be writing in your exam paper you can you can follow any one of them you can use the keynesian cross you can use the saving investment diagram or if you are asked to use this loanable fund interpretation you can use this diagram as well and so so that's all about you know uh, how you derive is curve what is is curve and how we derive is curve in the next class what we are going to do is 